In this video, we're going to look at the first principle for being a small group leader. Now, we believe that small groups are a vital vehicle for making disciples. And what that means is that leading a group is first and foremost about developing people. So it's not just about how good of a lesson you can teach or how good of a meeting you can run. Those are all great things, but many capable people can do those all by themselves. So to be successful as a small group leader is first and foremost, you have to develop other people. And that leads us to our first essential principle of leadership, and that is work as a team. Now we're gonna look at three different ways to do that. And the first one is that you can't lead a healthy group on your own. So if you think that you're just gonna lead this group by yourself or just you and your spouse, we want you to set that idea completely aside and think about how to build a team and how to work together as a team. Because if you think about it, looking at the Bible, even Jesus built a team. Soon afterward, Jesus began a tour of the nearby towns and villages, preaching and announcing the good news about the kingdom of God. He took his 12 disciples with him, along with some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Among them were Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons, Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's business manager, Susanna, and many others who were contributing from their own resources to support Jesus and his disciples. You can see there, he mentions the 12 disciples, as well as a number of women who traveled together with Jesus, so he wasn't working alone. And if he thought it was a good idea to build a team, then that probably applies to us as well because we all need what everyone else can contribute. And we see that in Ecclesiastes chapter four. Two people are better than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm. But how can one be warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. You can see all the benefits that come from working alongside of other people. And not just benefits for you as the leader, but also how it benefits the whole group. And it benefits the members of the group as well, because remember, we're making disciples, and that means developing people. Now, let me suggest four ways that, as a leader, you can help that happen in your group. First of all, you want to create an environment where everyone participates. This is how people learn and grow, by participating, not just by passively listening or watching other people do the ministry. And then secondly, we want you to be intentional about recruiting and equipping co-leaders. We'll talk about that more in a few minutes. And then the third thing, we want you to lead the discussion in a way that leads other people to get involved. Because you see, what we're doing is trying to make disciples, and what that means is that we don't want them to become dependent on you. And there's certain methods of teaching and leading that really make other people dependent on you as kind of the Bible answer man or the go-to answer guy. We don't want you to be that guy. You don't have to think of any great nuggets or, or somehow profound teachings that you have to bring in. Just use the curriculum. Just use the materials and lead the discussion so that people can grow and, and not be dependent on, on you and on your preparation in in order to succeed at, at growing in their faith. And then the fourth thing that you can do to create this kind of a group is ultimately, however you lead and however you teach needs to be reproducible. Because remember, we're not just talking about making disciples, but ultimately we're, we'd like to make disciples who make disciples. So everything that we ha do has to be reproducible, that somebody else can learn how to do it from me, and not only that, but they can then teach somebody else how to do it as well. And so if you as the leader or, or the teacher of the group are doing it in a way that puts all the emphasis on you and your knowledge, then that's not going to be reproducible. If you have to be, again, the Bible answer guy, the master teacher, that's not going to be reproducible. So just use the tools. They're designed to help make it uh, so that other people can use them after you. And if you use the tools, you're going to create an environment where you can make disciples who make other disciples. So our first principle about working as a team is that a healthy group, you don't lead a healthy group on your own. Now, there's a second thing I want you to consider as well. The second thing to keep in mind if you want to succeed in working as a team is to care about everyone in the group, but mentor a few. See, as a small group leader, you're kind of like the shepherd of the group. You're kind of like a pastor to that little flock. And so we want to encourage you to care about all of the members of your group but you're not gonna have time to make the same kind of investment in every single one of them. So that's why we say, care about everybody but mentor a few. Now the first part of that is that you need to create an environment of care. And we see this in Colossians chapter three. 
Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace. So you see a beautiful picture here of how God's people can really care for and encourage and love one another. And you set the tone for that as the leader. Not only do you care for the people in your group, but you also encourage and coach the members of the group to care for one another. Because you see, you're only one person, and so you're going to have to prioritize your resources as a leader. Jesus didn't have the same depth of relationship with everybody. He ministered to the crowds, 5,000 people at once, and then to his disciples. He had at least 70. And then there were the 12, and then there were three guys that he took with him often when the others didn't come. And so that's an insightful pattern about how we really can prioritize our resources by caring about everyone, but really focusing our mentoring efforts on a few in particular. And the place to start with that would be your co-leaders in really helping them to develop the knowledge and the attitudes and the skills to be able to lead the group themselves. And now that actually leads us to the third part about how to work as a team. Share ministry to develop co-leaders. You as the leader have got to learn how to give ministry away, to share it with other people. You've got to learn how to equip other people to serve. In fact, you should only be doing things that only you can do. If somebody else can do it, they should be doing it. And there's some really important reasons why this is important. Number one, it makes your whole group better. As you learn to give ministry away, that employs strengths and gifts of other people in the group that you don't possess. The group's going to be stronger because other people are going to be able to do things that you can't do, and they're going to do certain things better than you can do them as the leader. So find ways to help employ people's strengths and gifts and help them make a contribution to the group. And then the second thing that's important about doing this is it helps the group become ready to reproduce. You see, as you develop co-leaders, what's going to happen is that there's going to become people in your group who can do everything that you are able to do to lead the group. That means they become equipped to lead their own groups. And in fact, they're going to want to lead their own groups to go out and put into practice the things that you've built into their lives. Ultimately, the test of whether uh, you're a great leader is not in just how well you manage your own group, but in how you're developing other leaders as well. And your success as a leader then depends on whether or not other people are leading themselves as a result of your investment in their lives. But to develop co-leaders, it's going to require us to be intentional as leaders ourselves. Now, I say that as leaders, we have to be intentional because this is going to totally change how you prepare for the group. You're not just thinking about what's happening in, on the, during the meeting that week and what, how you're going to accomplish those things, but you're thinking about the people in the group and who you're going to employ and who you're going to equip to accomplish those things. So I'm not just preparing for the lesson. I'm helping someone else prepare for the lesson. I'm not just preparing for the prayer time. I'm helping someone else prepare for the prayer time. That's why it's a good idea for the group leader not to host the group because that just creates one other way that others can participate and begin to learn to lead. So learn to give away everything that you do in the weekly meeting. You don't have to be the one who prays. You don't have to be the one who uh, leads all the parts of the lesson. You can give it away to, to people at different levels of capacity. Some people can bring snacks. Other people can lead prayer. Other people can prepare some lesson, and you can help them to get better and better so they can increase their capacity with your coaching and your equipping. So here's a strategy on how to do that. Give people a small temporary assignment first. Don't ask somebody to take on a major thing that lasts for weeks and weeks. Give them one simple assignment that's just one time. Can you bring the snacks next week? Or can you lead the prayer time next week and I'll show you how? And that way you can test whether they're faithful and you can also test what their gifts might be. And as they prove faithful and as you discover their gifts, you can give them increasing levels then of, of participation and of involvement. This is all about working together as a team. So that's the first principle in leading a successful small group. It's not about giving a leader a platform as a teacher or to have personal influence. It's about developing people, developing disciples, and developing other leaders. And to do that, we work together as a team.